my computer today too. I don't know why, but I now have a backup Wi-Fi because I... I have like all these hotspots in my house and then who knows? Yeah, I just, <laughs> my internet went down for some crazy reason. I don't know why, but I have no. a backup internet. It's gone down so many times that I now have two internets in my house. So when one goes down, I just have to thank well, God or I wouldn't have been able to do this. Like it's the best, it's 50 extra dollars a month. I'm like, I should have done this years ago. Yeah, I got some of those little round ones and put them in different rooms, but I don't really think they help. Um, I think I'll take you in here. It's not going to look as good, but it'll be better quality sound. I get a tour of the house now. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll take you into the movie theater. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. but, oh, okay. that's nice. Yeah. So is the, now is, how's the Wi-Fi now? That's good. Say something else for a second. Okay. Um, how's the Wi-Fi now? So I'm literally in the room where the modem is. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, I great. forgot, what, what did I ask you about... We were talking about, um, oh, why, like what circumstances surrounded the suicide. Yeah. And so when he committed suicide, there were so many things looming out there that I think it was a myriad of things. I wasn't aware of all the financial problems until, of course, I was left with all of them. Um, so I know that was a big deal to him. And then the other thing was he was concerned that I was going to press charges and what the criminal implications of that would be. And then there was also some chatter that perhaps the DA would press charges anyway, whether I did or not, um, because it was such a public case. And, but I have to say, after I finally filed for divorce, he had never been nicer to me. And he was really trying to keep me under control to not press the charges. And he was constantly willing to talk about custody or settlements pretty much anything I wanted to talk about, which is how I ended up finding him was I had a meeting scheduled at his office to talk about all of those things leading to the divorce. And when I showed up, he wasn't there. And it just instantly had me thinking crazy things because he was so determined to do whatever I wanted to do in order to make this go smoothly. And that's when the wheels started turning after hours of not being able to reach him I thought something's definitely wrong. Really? Just because he was being so nice regarding the divorce. And he was such a workaholic for him not to be in his office for hours on end. And it was a Monday, you know, it just was so out of character. And especially to miss a meeting with me when he was to keep me from uh, legally against him. So that was a real, I don't know. I just had a weird feeling in my, in my gut about the whole thing as the day went on. And then was it, cause like there's right, the psychology that there's the control aspect, but also because like the narcissism is associated like with this type of, you know, abusive personality. Like, was it the narcissism of like, people are going to find out like not even the legal aspects of like my life could be ruined, but like people aren't going to love me. Like they're going to know the truth. Like, does that factor into like, like a characteristic of an abuser, like when it's going to be something public or not necessarily, if that makes any sense. I definitely think that the whole case uh, becoming public about the abuse was terrifying for several reasons. He was in the financial industry and most of his clients and people were in Beverly Hills. And he knew that behind all the other financial problems he was having, that he wasn't going to be having clients. I mean, people were going to abandon him over all of this. That makes sense too. Do you watch Beverly Hills Housewives? I'm just switching gears now. Do you watch Beverly Hills? Have you watched it throughout the years? I do not watch the Housewives shows and not because I don't think they're great, but truly it's so hard for me to see my friends argue with one another because I know what those feelings are like. And it almost brings up an anxiety for me, especially when Kyle and Lisa were still on the show. I was just waiting for that um, to blow up eventually. And it was, it, it would have been just way too painful for me to watch. Well, you know, did you, I'm sure you've heard like a few recently, like Lisa sent over her check as a joke to Kyle at dinner. Did you hear all this? Do you know what I'm I talking about? I haven't heard this. No, but I'm interested. <laughs> they were in the same restaurant and Kyle was with a producer, I think from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, but whoever it was, maybe it wasn't, it's the same producer that works on Overserved, Lisa Vanderpump and Vanderpump Rules. So they both knew this person. Alex. 
Yes. And Kyle <laughs> was having dinner with him and Lisa, she left an imprint of her credit card. She didn't, was not dining and dashing, but as a joke, she told the waiter to send her check over to Kyle. Okay. And the producer and the check was not paid. They did not pay it. So they ended up running Lisa's, but Lisa was like, it was a joke. So you, you're still friends with both of them, right? Yes. So, you know, if this bothers you, should we look to Taylor Armstrong? Maybe can you, can you make this work for the rest of the world, Taylor? (laughs) I would love to, I care for both of them. And when they're together and things are good, they're absolutely hysterical. And I think it's funny and almost like a little bit of extending the olive branch that Lisa would do something like that, you know, as opposed to just blowing it off and walking away. I think it's funny. Um, And that is so, so fitting of, of Lisa's personality. Um, but when they're together and they're good, they're great. But, you know, it's hard to have two queens. It is hard to have two queens. I mean, have you ever thought of like just, you know, staging all like I'm going to have dinner with Kyle and then, you you know, you're just bringing them together without telling the other one. And there you are. Or do you think that would backfire <laughs> on Taylor Armstrong? I, oh, my gosh. It sounds terrifying. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. Part of me likes it. I'll tell you what sometimes we say on TV or used to say, uh, the producer in me thinks it's a great idea. The human being in me finds it terrifying. Whose wrath would you be more afraid of at that point if neither of them were happy to be in this restaurant? (gasps) Oh my gosh. Um, uh, Probably Lisa. I don't know that I would push her buttons as, as much as I could probably push Kyle's a little bit more. I would be afraid to be on Lisa's bad side. Yeah. <laughs> what about, you know, how do you feel about, you know, cause to me, even though you don't watch it, you know, you hear things that happen in Beverly Hills, you know, in the beginning, if you look at like your seasons, the first few years, it wasn't just like what you were going through and with Russell, but like, you know, Kim and Kyle, that's real sisters, you know, Kim's alcoholism came out. Like these were real issues. Do you think like Beverly Hills has gotten away from that, you know, and now it's more like a watered down reality? The thing that's hard for me is when they insert these artificial relationships, because I think the audience can read that. And for instance, when they brought Brandy on, she was not friends with any of us and we didn't know her. And they had discovered after season one that because we had all become so close that they probably weren't going to get as much drama as they might want. So they brought her in as a catalyst and she did a great job with that. But when they, I feel like it's real obvious that if I were having a party, I wouldn't be inviting her because she's not in our friend group and I don't know her. And so some of that bothers me when I see that it just doesn't. 